Hi, welcome back to Mel's Health. I'm Mel, it's lovely to have you here. Today's video is going to be about the medications involved with a blood clot diagnosis. More specifically, the two that I have been prescribed because I don't really wanna talk about drugs that I haven't experienced myself, but I am gonna provide some information on the others that are widely used. In my last couple of videos, I talked about what thrombosis and embolism and related things are and what happened to me the day that I ended up going to hospital and getting diagnosed with submassive pulmonary embolism. If you haven't seen any of those, I highly recommend them. There's a lot of information in there about the actual condition and what happened to me. So back in May of 2020, when I received my diagnosis, I was initially put on the blood thinner Apixaban, aka Eliquis. And around that time, I decided to look at what the most common prescriptions are for blood thinners these days and why I had been given that prescription and found out that the most common ones presently are Ampixaban, but also Rivaroxaban, aka Xarelto, and Bigotran, aka Prodaxa. The reason why I keep saying AKA is because when it comes to these drugs, they're all very well known by both their pharmaceutical drug name and their brand name. Depending on who you speak to in different areas, who's doing your treatment, when you go to the pharmacy, anything like that, the names are totally interchangeable. So I'm just gonna always refer to them as both to avoid any confusion. So there are many other blood thinners, but these ones are relatively new in regards to medicines and they've proved to be effective and are currently the most widely used at the moment. Apixaban was only approved as an oral anticoagulant in the UK in 2013 and the US in 2014. It's been cut around being used in specific cases since about 2011, but overall a very new medicine. All the ones I've mentioned so far as well are known as DOACs, direct oral anticoagulants. So they're pill form and you take a tablet. There are also injectable medications known as low molecular weight heparins, which involve patients having to inject themselves subcutaneously, which means just underneath the skin. Um, but if anyone's watching and wants any more information on LMWHs, then I've actually attached some patient information sheets in the description below. Moving on, I think the most well-known blood thinner for most people will be warfarin, aka Coumadin, aka rat poison. I'll explain that a little bit later. It's been around for over 60 years now and it was the go-to medication for anticoagulation for a very long time and it's still very much widely used today. I'm currently prescribed it and I will tell you a lot more in detail a little bit later on in this video. I'm just going to focus on the Apixaban first because that's what I was given initially before being switched over. So what are blood thinners? Well, despite the name, they don't actually thin your blood and while we're on it, they don't dissolve the clots you have either. What they do is aid in preventing blood from forming new clots or current ones from getting any bigger. They're basically a medicine that helps blood flow more easily through the veins and arteries. Clots have to break down on their own over time. This is one reason why recovery from something like this can take so long. I'm almost eight months in and still not feeling much better. And at my six month review had a scan where it showed I had all the same clots in all the same places. They are taking their sweet time to break down. So what are blood thinners used for? People are prescribed blood thinners if they are at risk of developing blood clots that could lead to blockages in blood vessels and disrupt the flow of blood around the body. So most commonly they're prescribed for stroke, heart attacks, heart disease or irregular heartbeat and blood clot illnesses like DVT and pulmonary embolism. In my last video I also briefly brought up antiphospholipid syndrome which they test you for when you have been diagnosed with a blood clot. If you're diagnosed prior to having a blood clot as well, for whatever reason, you may also be prescribed blood thinners as a preventative measure because antiphospholipid syndrome is an autoimmune condition where the immune system attacks fats and proteins within the blood vessels, which causes the blood to clot. So if you're diagnosed with a blood clot and then you test positive for antiphospholipid syndrome, then you're a little worse off and it's quite likely that you're gonna require thinners 
for life to manage it. Of course, with all medications that you take, there is always a potential side effect or risk to the medication. With blood thinners, the main one is the possibility of excessive bleeding. Blood thinners increase the time it takes for clots to form and prevent clotting. So even small cuts and bruises will bleed for longer and a lot more. If you're on blood thinners, it's important to keep in touch with your doctor if you notice any of these following things. Severe bruising, regular bleeding gums, prolonged nosebleeds, passing blood when you pee or noticing that your stools are a dark brown, black or reddish colour. If you're vomiting, coughing up blood, dizziness and weakness, including like weakness of limbs like an arm or a leg, um, severe headaches, stomach aches, excessive prolonged menstrual bleeding in women and difficulty breathing and chest pain. These are the general warnings and side effects that come with all blood thinning medications. Some medications will come with their own specific warning for themselves, but these are the overall possible side effects to take note of. For the two that I'm focusing on today, Apixaban and Warfarin, they both react differently with different foods, drugs, supplements, etc. With Apixaban, there aren't really any major restrictions that I was told of or anything that food-wise is going to interact with it, except when I first got my prescription, the pill bottle had a huge warning about grapefruit, grapefruit juice. There is evidence to suggest that consuming grapefruit can have an adverse effect on that medication, um, so it would cause it to be less effective. But that was about it. It's a nice clean medication that doesn't restrict a whole lot of things that you take in. Warfarin, on the other hand, is a whole different story um, because it's a complex medication. Again, I'm gonna talk about it in just a few minutes. So what I've experienced so far, as I said earlier, I was given a Pixaban when I was in hospital and I remained on that medication for six months. I started off on two five mils twice a day and then I think it was after the first week and a half I went to one five mil twice a day and that was the dose I stayed on the whole of the time for the first six months. I didn't really notice any improvement on this drug. I was initially told that after the first few weeks being on meds I should start to feel a bit better as the clots break down and the blood starts to return to areas of my lungs that have been deprived of it for some time. So I attend a three month review in the August with my thrombosis doctor and just give her the report that I'm not feeling a whole lot better, I'm still having quite a bit of pain. But at this point she doesn't want to scan me again or anything because my care has been along the lines of they don't want to scan you more than once every six months because of the risks of the radiation that's going into you. She did acknowledge that I had a large amount of clot in my lungs when I was diagnosed so a minimum of six months on blood thinners was my treatment plan so I just went away on the same dose of apixaban ready to come back in another three months time and have a scan at the six month point. So as on a whole apixaban just kept me on this like plateau. It was more of a maintenance drug than anything else. I didn't get any better but I didn't get any worse. I didn't have side effects and it didn't interfere with my everyday life much um, but it obviously didn't help me um, and the discussion I've had with my thrombosis doctor around it is that if I have to take blood thinners for life it might be a good one for me to go back to because it would just be a good preventative measure so that I don't get any clots in the future but we'll see. All right let's talk about the costs. Well, I couldn't believe how expensive a Pixaban is and I would love to know what people are paying in other countries. I'm in BC, Canada and I collected three prescriptions of that medication. The first for 72 tablets was 150 bucks, second for 132 tablets was 265 and 180 tablets, the overall price was 357.57 absolutely insane to me. I know healthcare and prescription costs vary a lot around the world. Um, in Canada we do have free healthcare, it's very similar to when I grew up in the UK and we had the NHS where I didn't have to pay anything extra for my hospital stay, the ambulance journey, the scans or anything like that. But here you pay for the whole prescription cost but you can have certain benefits that can pay partial or full amounts of those. 
I'm extremely fortunate that I'm covered under my fiance's extended benefit plan that he gets from his work. Funny story, I did have my own extended benefits through my job, but when I got sick and couldn't work full time anymore, I lost them. <laughs> you just have to laugh, don't you? What was the point? But I digress. I have the privilege of being covered for a portion of the medication cost, but it's still ridiculously expensive. And it's not like you can't take it. You know, I need this medication to keep me alive. I don't know if anything's changed back home where I'm from in the UK, but it was always the thing that if you got a prescription through the NHS, there was this flat rate for each of the items that you need on that prescription. And it was like less than a tenner. So I'd be interested to find out what it is back home. If anyone's watching from the UK and you're having to pay extra for a Pixaban or anything, let me know. But I'm also would like to know if it is just the flat rate and you're paying less than 10 quid for a prescription. Okay, warfarin, Coumadin. Where to start with warfarin really? A brief history lesson. So it all stems from a dairy farmer in the US in the 20s whose cows were all dying from the same disease that caused them to bleed to death. A vet determined that it was a crop in the cattle field called sweet clover that was used as hay to feed them but if they munched on it after it had gone mouldy it was causing the cows to die. So this farmer was desperate to get this figured out and stop his cows from dying so he decided to drive to the University of Wisconsin with some sweet clover a tank full of blood of his dead cows that wouldn't clot, and a natural cow. When he was there, he met with biochemist Professor Carl Link. Now he couldn't actually help the cows, but he did put a team together to start doing research on the sweet clover disease. After seven years of research, they found the chemical compound that discouraged blood clotting in mice and rabbits. This is dicumarol. One of the variants that they tested happened to be so potent in rats that they developed it into a rat poison and called it warfarin. And warfarin is actually an acronym, I don't think many people know, but it stands for Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation and then the ARIN comes from the chemical coumarin. It then became the most popular rat poison on the market used commercially from 1948. Soon after this though, it was identified that it would be safe for use in humans. But a lot of doctors didn't really want to prescribe their patients rat poison, funnily enough. So when 1954 came along and it was approved for clinical use, they just simply renamed it Coumadin. It was in 1955 when things took off a little bit more because they used it to treat the then US President Eisenhower after he had a heart attack and he was all right. So there you go. I actually found a really good animated video that tells that exact story on the YouTube channel Nature Video and I've put the link down below in the description. It's definitely worth a watch. So being such an old medication with such an interesting history, Warfarin has the most interactions with foods, drugs, supplements, and so on that I've ever seen. It can be affected by something like over 120 different things. When you take warfarin as well, you also have to have regular blood tests where they measure your INR, and that stands for International Normalized Ratio, which is basically how long it takes your blood to clot. Your average Joe out there not taking any meds at all will have a reading of about 1.0, but the general target for someone taking warfarin is usually between 2.0 to 3.0. So since being prescribed warfarin back in November, I've been having weekly blood tests for them to get my INR level, and it helps the doctor decide what dose of the medication I'm gonna be on. I started on five mils and I had a very low reading right at the beginning, it was just 1.2. And then I slowly crept up, they put my meds up to seven mil and I got to 1.8. Then I went up to eight mil and I kind of stayed around that level. I did hit 2.1, um, but then I went back down. So now I have different doses. I take eight mils Monday to Thursday and then nine mil Friday to Sunday. But my last INR was only 1.9. So I'm going to wait to see what today's test results come back as. I had a little blood test this morning and uh, we'll go from there. So you get different colour tablets for different size doses when you're prescribed warfarin. And most people taking the medication generally know the dose by what the colour of the pill is. I also have to split some of my tablets in half to create the right dose for myself. 
It's a lot of admin, this blood thinner life. Um, so due to my ever-changing dose, um, the fact that I'm on different doses for different days and that I have to cut them, I have a pill organizer and a pill cutter, which works wonders for keeping track of what I need to take and when. So I highly recommend getting these things if you're on any of these medications or especially warfarin and it's moving around quite a lot because it keeps things regular and organized. As I said before, warfarin has a lot of interactions, but you can't keep track of every single thing that might have an effect on this medication. When I first switched on to warfarin, this is one of the sheets that the doctor gave me about what interacts with the medication. There are so many things on just this one sheet and it's not even an exhaustive list. It's medications that can increase the INR, can decrease the INR, things that you're not allowed to drink, things that you're not allowed to eat, supplements that you can't take. And it was just a snapshot of the things that interact with this medication. <laughs> But the main things that you're told or should be told when you're going on to this medication is about keeping your diet the same. Any drastic changes, additives or irregularities, they're going to affect the INR and you're going to increase your chance of excessive bleeding. The main thing to be aware of with warfarin and diet is foods that contain vitamin K. Vitamin K is an antidote to warfarin. And if you look up anywhere what foods to avoid as they'll make warfarin less effective, you're gonna find a lot of bullet pointed information like this. Basically, leafy greens, salads, avocados, and in regards to drinks, alcohol isn't advised, but cranberry juice, pomegranate juice, grapefruit juice, green tea, they're all highlighted to avoid for their adverse effect on the medication. I'll put some links below as well about where you can find some easy to understand information on warfarin. So just to round this video up, I'll just go back to the cost real quick. If you remember me talking about the Apixaban earlier and how expensive it was, warfarin is a world away. So I had that prescription earlier and it was 180 tablets of 5 mil Apixaban and it was 357.57 CAD. Well, I collected 65 mils of warfarin for 25 bucks and 92 mils for 33 bucks. The total prescription of that to the point was 58.92 for 150 tablets. So the cost is like five or six times higher for a Pixaban. It's absolutely mental. So that about rounds up my main knowledge and experience so far on blood thinners. If much changes in the future, then I will absolutely update with a follow-up video. There's some extra links below with some general information regarding blood thinners, and I'd love to hear your experiences and the costs you had. So drop me a comment below or feel free to join my free Discord server. If you found this informative and helpful, then please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel for more content. It really, really does help me out being a new channel, believe me. And I'm very, very appreciative of every single one of you. So stay tuned for some more content around my experiences. I think I'm gonna focus next on the first six months of recovery and discuss my visits to thrombosis clinic, do a little diagram of where my clots are actually located and what my treatment plan looks like. As always, I thank you very, very much for watching. Please subscribe for some more content and I'll see you soon. Bye.